about like the future, about what happened in the mobility space, you know, the mass, the mobility as a service space. And for that, we have Oliver Tam about how to fix the open data and API mess. He's the co-founder of xapix.io. You can also read it, read it like xapix. Thank you very much, Oliver. How are you? We don't hear you, Oliver. You're on mute. The most pronounced sentence over the last year. You're on mute. <laughs> Now, yeah, now it works. Perfect. Great. Yeah, thanks for the warm introduction, Midi. Um, you, thanks for spelling out uh, Xapix IO. Um, that's not easy to get right. So, I'm a co founder um, of Xapix, and we've been in the mobility space for quite some time already, a couple of years. Um, I have some very interesting customers, seen a lot of interesting projects. Um, I'm the lead engineer, um, and yeah, other than that, I'm from Berlin. I uh, am in data integration for even before I started Zapix. Um, I'm very passionate about solving the problem of m getting humans to connect data, uh, to work with data. I think we need easier tools. I think we need um, more standards, ideally. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. So what I did for you is this sort of collage um, outlining the path forward for this gazillion dollar industry that is mobility. Everyone wants to get from A to B. Um, we have a lot of very interesting developments in that space, like self-driving, um, connected cars, smart cities, and so forth. They're all touching this data landscape that we'll see around the car. So this talk basically consists of two bigger parts. Uh, the first section is going to be about future of mobility and what that is and how complex it is. And the second part of this presentation is going to be about the data disaster that is upcoming if we don't set things up better than we're headed for right now, I would say. Um, and yeah, I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, approaches that we can take to make our lives easier in the future. Yes, what is uh, the big vision? Um, for mobility, um, we have so many players in the market, effectively everyone um, that is in, in big tech. Um, they all have their own visions. They all work on different things. They are all members of this huge market that affects everyone and every day. So basically, the, the future of mobility is supposed to be uh, connected. So we want to hook up uh, all these devices, all these cars, um, all the uh, scooters, um, all the machinery that we operate in the public space. We want to connect that to the internet. We want to integrate it. We want all this, of course, to be frictionless. Um, we see autonomous uh, cars driving around on their own. Um, even reducing our ability as humans to kind of um, to, to straighten things out that technology um, may mess up uh, in the process of that. We're talking a lot about smart cities, smart countries even. Um, we want everything to be programmable, app stores, whatever. Like we want, we want to innovate uh, in that mobility space. And I could go on and on and on. Um, I, I put together um, this collage of videos and may just want to let the industry speak for itself, right? I'm not affiliated to any of these companies, by the way. With the evolution of 5G, the automotive and telecommunications industries are working to create a connected, cooperative, automated mobility. Connected vehicles are enabling easier, safer, and hassle-free road travel while bringing in-vehicle infotainment to the next level. To improve traffic safety, 5G Cellular to Everything technology is connecting vehicles to other vehicles, to infrastructure, to vulnerable road users, and to network services across any distance. 
The power of 5G is enhancing assisted driving and paving the way for fully automated driving experiences. Nokia is already helping automotive manufacturers optimize their local and global fleets with the creation of a secure and scalable global Internet of Things infrastructure. And by managing a wide range of technologies and applications that support connected vehicles, it brings the power of advanced analytics to driver experience and vehicle diagnostics and maintenance. It's all part of Nokia's end-to-end -end 5G network and partnerships, designed to boost the efficiency and productivity of global assets and enhance the world we live in. This is Nokia 5G. Deliver the extraordinary. Woohoo! Wow. Um, yeah, big visions, uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on in that market. Um, I really hope you heard the video sound. Otherwise, this is going to, this would have been very boring. Um, no, but like great visions. Um, I can't wait to see the future come to life. But we have work ahead of us um, as IT people, as data integrators. You probably had a hunch that this will be the case. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these complexities. Um, in the in the upper uh, right corner on, on my screen, um, I always have this little bit of a, a sentiment box. Um, great British comedy show, IT crowd. Can only recommend watching it. Um, to uh, yeah, to give you a little bit of, of the sense how I feel um, putting these these slides together. Um, and I want to start like on a very atomic level. Uh, let's start it simple. We have um, various variants um, of cars in manufacturers, right? So as long as two cars of the same variant of a manufacturer may be built in the same years or like just a few years apart, um, things are pretty easy. It's very likely that they have the same data interface, that they speak like the same protocols, and that maybe not so much has changed. I want to I want to leave out here that in today's uh, mobility in, or in the modern industry and in, in cars, um, most of them are very uh, individually configured. Um, so we're not in a in a space anymore where people buy cars they find in stores that have been mass produced. Usually, uh, cars are individually pr uh, produced these days with a very specific set of extras. So even inside a car, you have quite a bit of a data integration challenge. Anyway, let's leave that aside. Maybe so we have two cars that are of the same variant of a model, and they can probably talk to each other. Let's let's assume that. So things get a little bit more tricky when it's different models, you know, like big car manufacturers, they have plants all over the world. They produce different cars and different plants. Um, things may still be good to go, but um, a little bit harder already. And then the next we're talking about cars from different manufacturers. So we have all this spiel of, um, yeah, corporate rivalry um, about uh, industry standards that had historically a hard time um, getting together on their own and things like that. So we'll have um, a lot of different um, interests in the game. Um, and I want to zoom in like one level more, uh, one level deeper. So we, we not only have like car cars um, that we ride to work, um, there's also other types of, of vehicles on the road, like trucks, buses, um, we have bikes, motorbikes, we have construction uh, vehicles, um, we have drones, maybe air taxis, who knows, um, airplanes, yeah, why, why not, why the hell not? Um, and um, in, in the red circle, you still find one notable item, which is an old car, and we'll still see these around a lot. So there will be cars that are just not connected to anything because they're old timers, because they're uh, because they're 50 years old and just never got the technology kind of to participate in this connected world. And we will need to account for them, right? Like we need to pay attention um, to what they do in traffic so we won't collide with them. And then going one level deeper, we're getting into the IT infrastructure um, level of the problem um, that I'm talking about. We'll have like roughly a hundred different 
um, car manufacturer brands in the world. We see like roughly 60 major logos uh, up there in the upper left corner. Um, all of them, all of them have these different models. They have these different vehicle types. Um, they all produce different sets of vehicles. They all have vehicles that are around for 100, for 100 years or 50 years or whatever. Um, and they all have their legacy IT infrastructure, right? So they all have a different set of tools and production use. Um, they all have their different sets of uh, legacy software and uh, legacy interfaces in place. Um, so all these kind of things. And um, another dimension of um, of this is then also the on-car uh, services that we're seeing in the uh, lower right corner here. So we have a, a lot of different new startups um, that came up in the past like 10, 15 years maybe that put sensors and all kinds of uh, IT infrastructure on your car if you as a car manufacturer did not uh, decide to develop your own IT equipment or you have like some sort of corporations or whatever is going on. Um, you will have like different sets of integrated devices from different manufacturers, from different sensor types that are built into your cars, maybe even of the same model, maybe even of the same variant. And then we have this set of um, helpful platforms in the middle. I don't know if uh, Red Hat um, developed one, uh, maybe, maybe that's a good question for my previous presenter. Um, but there's a big one from AWS, the AWS Connected Vehicle Solution. Microsoft has a connected vehicle platform. SAP has a solution. So um, in this effort to integrate all these um, or parts of, of these ecosystems, we already still create like another level of complexity because we will probably end up having five, six, seven uh, of these different platforms that all do very similar things. So uh, so these platforms need to talk to each other and talk to their respective, pro uh, respective products and uh, partners. So all that uh, is going to be very interesting and um, very complex. And we can even go one level deeper in uh, just to make the confusion complete. So all I've been talking about so far is in the red box in the center. But that's just a subset of the entire tech startup supplier ecosystem around mobility. Um, I, I just put together a lot of these very handy, uh, very handy uh, brand slides. So we see um, we see personal devices. We say connected to. We see we see uh, uh, platforms. Um, we see connected cars. We see connected transportation. Uh, really, really just a subset. There's so many softwares that in this connected world somehow need to talk to each other, at least partially, at least like on some protocol level, uh, need to be able to exchange information. Otherwise, we'll have um, isolated uh, solutions and sort of a patchwork uh, kind of ecosystem that is um, not going to be very open to further innovation and further integration. Yes, and um, I hope I didn't shock you too much um, with all these with all these logos and with all these solutions that I presented. Um, but I I still have like one more piece of bad news, which is we keep inventing new stuff. So um, this is the Gardner hype cycle for mobility technologies. So right now we see at the top of it uh, 5G. Everyone's talking about it. In vehicle advanced UX and UI kind of. Uh, pays into that app store kind of idea and mobility. Um, yeah, we have things that are further down the hype cycle, things that are still on their way up. Anyway, um, we can. it's safe to assume that we'll keep inventing new stuff. Um, and you got to stay up to speed and like read the news, uh, read the magazines. I can recommend the white paper of my uh, co-founder who's a absolute mobility geek and expert. Um, yeah, find it on Zapix.io and, and read our blog. Um, can only recommend it. 
but that is it. So that is um, that is the bad news. This is kind of like the the, the extent of the problem um, that we're looking into. Um, and um, I, I now want to talk about the data side of uh, of things after talking about the business side for so long. So um, as you know, um, probably as someone who's attended this conference now for a day or maybe even in the past uh, for a couple of times, we have a lot of different protocols. We have a lot of different API schemas and standards. Um, we have best practices. We have designs. Um, we talk a lot about it on this conference, and it's really a good place to go for this. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot. Um, if you're in the data integration space and considering this, um, these these hundreds of solutions that I just showed you, you can expect pretty much everything to some extent being in use at, let's say, like at three various customers, I have random customers you, you put you pick out of this this batch, uh, you'll find the complete set of the technologies um, of the glossary um, that I just played um, in use. And uh, I put this together for less technical people uh, for, for the onboarding in our company. Um, and it, it took me quite some effort to just write it out in simple words what all these things are. But this is just the protocol level. So we're, we're just talking about the technical basics. Um, there are, for each of these problems, like REST APIs, like SOAP APIs, there are a myriad of tools um, for various types of use cases. So um, AI use cases will have a different set of solutions in place than machine learning, or than uh, what we call big data, or um, what we call I don't know, like microservices, you know, they, they all have these different sets of tools that all kind of work with these protocols and that do something in, in that range. Um, but they, they won't do the same. They're all specialized on different things. But if we want to keep the big picture in mind in this connected mobility uh, vision that we're chasing after, also these solutions need to produce results that produce a similar thing. So there's a gazillion different tools. I have a big green arrow there to um, to to Xapix, so we're in the game as well. Um, slide from from Medi. Um, it's it's a wild landscape, and it's 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 getting more and more. Um, and we'll need to find approaches to deal with that. All right. So that is the private part of the. The data issue, the uh, public issue, will also play um, a big role. We, we know this as like generally the open data um, topic, open or smart cities, smart countries. Um, we're dealing with a lot of languages and even worse, different alphabets. For example, so this is your fact of the day. Um, Zimbabwe has the highest number of official languages in the world. It has 16 different languages that are all official and can be in use. Um, in Europe, we have a similarly complex situation. I would almost say we have one market, but so many different languages. So if on the European Union level, for example, you would uh, have a, um, a data standard or like a, a joint policy um, to publish certain types of data, you can still expect lots of complexity from these different languages, from sometimes these different alphabets, um, and from the general uh, human error, and of course, differences in public legislation. So if you have uh, 200 different local governments making open data policies, I, I would say you can expect 198 uh, different outcomes um, in their policy. As one example here, I have one um, from, from Germany uh, in the center. This is a statistic um, about dogs in a small town somewhere in North Rhine-Westphalia, I believe, Mörs. Um, they publish the amounts of dogs each household um, has. I assume it must have something to do with, with pet taxes or something like that. and. There is a policy to publish that data and make it available to the public. 
But then we look at the CSV file, and it's not very machine readable, right? Like this is not a this is a good CSV sort of for for humans, like a good Excel sheet. Instantly understand what's going on, but it's very hard to parse. And Murs is the only city that I found in Germany that publishes that data set as open data. So how useful is this? Well, I think we can work on that. Um, yeah, and then of course um, we have, uh, for example, Chinese data, something that doesn't even, I don't even actually know, understand how their alphabet works, um, but uh, definitely not very readable for me. Um, anyway, if you're riding a car or you have like a mobile app that gives you access to all public transportation worldwide, right? Like, how amazing would that be? It's it would need to integrate with China or with Thailand and other uh, countries that don't even have uh, the Latin alphabet or something. So also that will need to be accounted for, and of course we have um, data uh, policy um, differences. So in, in China, uh, open data is. Very critical thing. No data can leave China. Um, the U European Union is, is working on it. Um, I, I would say the US has pretty pretty nice um, legislation in, in place already. But you know, we're we're still talking island solutions, like little happy islands where things are good and pretty messy uh, around it. Um, yeah, and uh, another part of open data is data formats. Um, so when we're talking about uh, CSV files not being uh, well readable, there's a lot of uh, states that publish data in PDF and expect you to read their open data from a PDF table that doesn't even need to, uh, to follow a specific format. Um, the criterion is fulfilled, you know, like I'm an employee in the government. Um, I follow the policy to publish data. I put it in a PDF. I put it on a server. Criteria fulfilled. Next day, uh, new work. So um, we'll we'll need to get better alignment on this. Otherwise, this whole smart city, smart country thing is going to be really, really difficult. So one approach would be more elaborate business data standards. Um, I've written a longer blog post about this uh, myself. You'll find it on the Zapix blog. Um, I'm happy to share the links if you if you email me uh, afterwards or um, put it here in the chat. Um, yeah, industry-led standardization initiatives have uh, suffered a bit from a variety of problems, usually uh, due to rather weak incentives to actually collaborate with um, colleagues from or like people in the same role in, in other corporates, oftentimes just corporate policies actively working against that. Um, sometimes even if you're a market leader in a space like a mobility, um, we saw that in a couple of segments, um, that uh, you you are one of the, the leaders in your segment and you don't want your competition to catch up. So you try to kind of encapsulate and protect um, your market position also on the data level. So we see, we see that. Um, every now and then we, we could see it, for example, on the CAN bus uh, example. So the CAN bus, uh, C-A-N bus, is uh, the bus that um, that uh, passes on all the data inside a car. So from your um, AC to uh, your central controller, your steering wheel, like all, all this kind of data flows to the CAN bus uh, to some degree. And there's been numerous attempts in the past to um, to standardize this uh, CAN bus protocol and like find joint rules to also make, for example, um, maintenance a lot easier for independent uh, garages and things like that. But we're, we're talking about this for 50 years now and we're still not there and the situation is rather getting worse. So um, my money would probably not be so much on the industry-led standardization initiatives, just telling from history. Um, I would rather um, seek the legislative way. Um, yes, led um, parliaments, like <laughs> politicians are usually, and, and even if they're experts, are usually not the best people to come up with standards. But if they come up with these standards, at least you have something to follow, you know? Like I feel 
at this point, um, it's pretty clear to me that having a standard and like putting it down, even if it's a bad standard, is still a lot better than not having a standard and like working for 50 years on a better standard that never comes to life. Um, so we've seen a positive example <clears throat> uh, in the banking sector just recently in Europe, um, where, where we had the, the Basel II legislation that forced basically every um, financial institution to expose certain types of data through a standard. And uh, that worked surprisingly well, even though people weren't happy with the standards, but I think we're pretty much done implementing um, this at this point. So um, I think with proper legislation in place, things can move a lot quicker and are a lot more promising. All right. Um, yeah, and the other uh, private um, effort uh, we can take is better integration tools. Um, so at, at Zapix, we're working on it still, um, but we've seen all the diagrams. There's so many uh, solutions in place um, that tackle a whole lot of different problems. Uh, if we can agree, come together and um, get some industry standards on just talking about open API, for example, right? Like great, great initiative, um, big corporations coming together, um, agreeing on one standard, abandoning the old formats, great stuff. We need more of that. I'm a big fan. Um, I'm, I'm convinced it will make all our tools better. Um, so we want our data integration to become cheaper and faster and uh, also easier so more people can do them, right? Like if we want to do all this uh, huge magnitude of data integration um, with software developers, then we're gonna run out of software developers pretty soon. So we need more and easier tools um, to make this whole process easier and to have um, other people than programmers um, do this data integration. Yeah, low code. I think that's pretty much the uh, the key word here already. Um, well, we've we've been talking a lot about like data pipelines and open data platforms and so forth. Yeah, and the third uh, pillar of this is education. Like we all need to stay up to speed. Uh, we need to understand more, um, see more things, um, read more things. I think API Days definitely is the right place to start. API CNIO is the official blog. Um, I've done like one or two blog posts for them too. I uh, can only recommend them. And yeah, share your learnings, educate each other internally inside your company here at API Days. Talk to each other about APIs and what's what's good and bad about them. Um, make your API into a product. Um, think it from the customer perspective and um, yeah, learn every day. And that's pretty much what I have about this. Of course, huge topic. Questions could go either way. Um, I'm I'm done with uh, with my presentation for now. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Oliver. So we were we we're a little bit out of time, but I just wanted to have a question: Is all the standards you are putting in this in this space uh, would be actually in the you know the international data spaces that the Europe has made for specific industries? You know to share better data under let's say GDPR regulation. So would all the standard you've made uh, be actually even more useful into these international data spaces? Uh, yeah, I, I wish. Um, it, I think standards would always be helpful. Um, again, even even a bad standard would be would be great if it's uh, implemented um, everywhere. Um, I think the standards are okay. Um, we but well, we need to get started. You know, like I'm, yeah. I'm sort of like I'm drifting away from the um, from the how good does this need to be to the let's have let's agree on something and get that done. Yeah, that's where I, I am right now. I agree with that, and I hope the mobility as a service space uh, or is definitely one that will gather a fragmented community in, around some d global decisions. Thank you very much, Oliver. So if you want to uh, like integrate uh, APIs more easily in your system, you can go on xapix.com, xapix.io. Um, and uh, uh, yes, thank you very much, Oliver, for being there with us, even if it's late in Germany. But it's an international event, so uh, we're trying to have people from all over the place. Thanks. Have a good one.